So next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Myra Parker, who will introduce and moderate the discussion with our first speaker of the day. Dr. Parker. Thank you. Our first presentation will be given by Dr. Paula Braveman. Dr. Braveman is a professor of family and community medicine and the director of the Center for S on Social Disparities in Health at the University of California, San Francisco. For the past 30 years, she has studied and published on health equity, health disparities, and the social determinants of health with a focus on socioeconomic and racial and ethnic disparities in maternal and infant health. She is the author of a recently published Robert Wood Johnson Foundation report titled Early Childhood is Critical to Health Equity, which she'll be, she will be discussing with us today. Please welcome Dr. Braveman. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you. It is a, a real pleasure to be here. So I was asked to address um, some salient issues in thinking about early childhood from a health equity perspective. Much of what I'll be presenting is based on the report that was just mentioned that came out of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And I, in terms of uh, disclosing sources of support, the work that I'll be presenting was supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. So, can everybody read the print in that? The, one gent in what looks like an exclusive club saying to the other, well, the poor are getting poorer, but with the rich getting richer, it all averages out uh, in the long run. And my point in showing you this is to say that averages are indeed very important, but averages are not what we're talking about when we're talking about equity. When we're talking about equity, we're talking about differences, and difference, specifically differences that strike us as particularly unfair. So are all health differences unfair? Um, if I tell you that skiers have, are much more likely to um, have arm or leg fractures than non-skiers, would that make you morally indignant? Would you be outraged? No, okay. If I told you that uh, if wealthy people had higher rates of an illness than poor people, should that count as a health inequity, a health, a health disparity? How about if I say that younger adults are generally healthier than the elderly? And I will have to confess that on this one, I have a very big problem, which is that the older I get, the more unfair that seems to me to be. <laughs> Men have a shorter life expectancy. Is that the kind of health difference that we're um, concerned with when we're dealing with health equity? I would say no, and we could have a discussion for hours about, about that. Um, but the point here is, so who determines what's fair? And sometimes it's obvious um, with some of the examples I gave you, and sometimes it's not, it's not so obvious. But who determines and, and how? What are the criteria? for determining whether a given uh, health difference uh, is unfair. Uh, so also supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, um, I worked with um, staff in the foundation uh, in 2017 to come up with a definition of health equity that um, staff felt were going to meet their needs. That within the foundation, people had become aware that everybody was talking about health equity, but that there wasn't a, 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 um, uh, a common uh, core of meaning that, that was necessarily shared on that. So I'll just read you, the, there are two parts to this. Health equity means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. This requires removing obstacles to health, such as poverty, discrimination, and their consequences including powerlessness and lack of access to good jobs with fair pay, quality education and housing, safe environments, and health care. So it's a mouthful. Um, but we also added another mouthful um, because the, the first piece, um, although it met uh, a, a, there was a very high pr priority that we placed on coming up with a definition that could be operationalized. There was a feeling that there were definitions out there that were more 
lyrical and lovely and maybe even more uh, more inspiring, but that they left too much room for um, interpretation in concrete sense. And so we wanted to call out poverty. We wanted to call out discrimination, powerlessness, and mention social determinants of health. But although we thought that the first part of this uh, you know, might be might be adequate um, to address those concerns about operationalizing, um, et cetera. It wasn't adequate to guide measurement. Um, and so here's the measurement part. For the purposes of measurement, health equity means reducing and ultimately eliminating disparities in health and its determinants. And I want to emphasize that it's not just in health, it's in the determinants of health that adversely affect excluded or marginalized groups. Uh, and one comment I want to make about, uh, about this is that this definition, and this was another very important criterion that we had in mind, which is that uh, one should not need to make causal inferences um, in order to decide whether a given uh, health difference was uh, an inequity or d disparity or not, because as anybody here knows it's very, very difficult to um, make causal inferences, to support causal inferences. So I wanted to show you this um, partly to underscore that part of the definition that I just gave you that talked about how health equity requires removing obstacles to health. And I think that that's a very important concept, the concept of obstacles. And here you see the first person just bounding toward the goal of, of health and then the other two laden down, um, both with boulders on their back, one also having humps in the road to go over, and the, um, the third one there really having some pretty high hurdles in addition to the huge boulder. Um, one of the reasons that I like this concept of obstacles to health uh, is that I think that it, um, it's very much in line with international human rights principles and principles and, and laws, okay? So apart from, you know, how anyone might use to define, um, what, what specific wording uh, one might use to define health equity, um, I think that it, I would hope that, um, that there would be consensus about two basic elements. Um, and so one basic element is that there's a focus on groups who have historically been excluded or marginalized. And you can think of that as groups that have had more social obstacles to health. And then the second essential component of health equity is that there is the imperative to address underlying determinants of health. So fundamental obstacles such as poverty, discrimination, and powerlessness. So not only behaviors, um, or lack of medical care. Okay. So this diagram was originally developed for the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's commission to build a, a healthier America. And here you see what we in the US, um, anyhow, have largely been focusing on for a number of decades, which is medical care and uh, behaviors, and the way we focus on the behaviors is that we inform people of how they should behave, and we tell them that they should behave better. We've failed to look at what it is that not only determines who does and who doesn't get medical care uh, and the quality of that care, but also what very powerfully shapes behaviors and what, in addition, shapes health in important ways without even going through pathways that involve behaviors or medical care, for example, by creating stress or exposure to toxic, uh, toxic substances. And we certainly have not in, uh, addressed the underlying economic and social opportunities and resources, um, which a lot of evidence tells us uh, are responsible for systematically sorting different groups of people in this country into healthy and unhealthy living conditions, largely according to the wealth and the skin color of the parents to whom that a person happens to be born. 
This, um, this also came from the work for the RWJ Commission. Um, uh, we were trying to look for a way to express a life course perspective and to show that the life course perspective is more than just saying that child health has a big influence on adult health. It's about saying that the social and economic opportunities that one has at one stage of one's life shape the living and working conditions at that stage, which then shape health but they also shape the social and economic opportunities and the living conditions in the next stage of health. And so what we have set up here, this is meant to illustrate how we can have cycles that can be of advantage, or the cycles, unfortunately, are often of, um, of disadvantage. Okay. So what's the link between um, early childhood and health equity? Um, we know that experiences, a whole range of experiences throughout life can affect health. But we have learned that experiences in the first five years of life can, are, seem to have particularly strong effects and that they have lifelong effects. Uh, and there's a variety of kinds of experiences that I'm talking about here. I'm talking about material living conditions, but also talking about social experiences, uh, nurturing and safe and supportive and stimulating relationships, and talking about experiences of chronic stress, um, which neurophysiology has so uh, well illustrated um, uh, its connection to chronic disease manifesting in in later adulthood. We know that income and discrimination influence all of these, all of these experiences, and there's very good um, literature on that. Now this, I'm, uh, I know that you probably can't read the, the letters in the small boxes, but the reason I wanted to quickly show you this is that I'm gonna be breaking this down into some pieces, um, but I want you to have the um, the notion that those each of those pieces fits into a much more complex whole. And I also want to acknowledge that as complex as this looks, it's a gross oversimplification because these factors, all of the factors that are, that are up here um, may interact with each other and with factors that aren't even depicted on these pathways at all. So it's, it's, it's very complex but we use simplifications to, um, uh, to advance our learning, to organize our, our thinking. So what's one piece of this? And it, it's the piece that connects poverty or economic deprivation with ill health. Um, we know that economic deprivation in the first five years of life is connected with premature mortality, with chronic, chronic disease. A lot of that literature comes from Europe. There's been much more. Um, uh, life course um, epidemiology done uh, in Europe and looking specifically at economic deprivation in childhood, including it in early childhood. We know that this happens through multiple uh, pathways that are both linked and that are in, in interacting. Three of the ways in my attempt to sort of simplify things um, here, I've in that diagram that I just showed you and in um, how I'm going to be discussing it, they have singled out three um, particularly uh, strong and dominant pathways. One is through unhealthy living conditions, another is through parental stress, and another is through suboptimal cognitive, emotional, and behavioral development. Oops. That's better. Okay, so to look at um, unhealthy uh, living conditions, that poverty limits where families can live. And living conditions such as housing and air quality, home and community safety, and food environments powerfully affect young children's health. Children living in lower income neighborhoods are more likely to be exposed to lead-based paint, which of course can lead to irreversible neurologic damage. They're more likely to be exposed to air pollution and other toxic substances to crime, to violence, and to injury. Both household budget constraints and high concentrations of convenience stores and fast food outlets 
in low-income neighborhoods can thwart even the most motivated parents' efforts to provide nutritious food to their children. Inadequate uh, nutrition in early childhood increases the likelihood of childhood obesity, which strongly predicts obesity as an adult, and the accompanying uh, risks of chronic disease, disability, and premature mortality. But it's not just about poverty. Um, structural racism denies people of color equitable access to healthy living conditions. Children in African-American, American Indian, and Latino families of all economic levels are often disadvantaged by structural racism, sometimes called institutional racism or systemic racism, meaning race-based unfair treatment that's built into institutions and policies and practice as a historical legacy of discrimination that not that long ago was deliberate and overt and legal. This legacy persists despite um, whether any particular individual now consciously intends to discriminate. So although it's no longer legal to discriminate in housing, the U.S. remains starkly segregated along racial lines. Discriminatory housing and banking practices historically have relegated residents in largely minority areas to poor housing and environmental quality, inferior schools, and poor access to transportation, the latter of which is needed to access employment opportunities. These disadvantages can accumulate and constrain families' near and long-term socioeconomic opportunities, which in turn limit their access to healthy living conditions. Unhealthy living conditions can lower children's resilience by compromising their immune and emotional regulation systems. The health, <clears throat> excuse me, the health consequences of unhealthy conditions can accumulate across lifetimes and across generations. And as a result, young children can suffer in er their early childhood. They can suffer the effects of racism experienced by their parents even decades ago. For example, poverty experienced by young children often reflects lack of educational opportunities for their parents due to racial discrimination when their parents were children and young adults. So I think we always have to keep that historical frame in mind. Now, another major pathway that I mentioned in addition to living conditions is through stress. So sustained poverty can create chronic stress for children and for parents with adverse consequences for children's lifelong health. Biomedical research has linked economic and other social disadvantages in early childhood with chronic disease later in life. Physiologic changes associated with chronic stress, including inflammation and altered immune function, have been identified as likely contributors to depression, anxiety, hypertension, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease in adulthood. Experiencing multiple chronic hardships can produce toxic stress. When experienced during early childhood, toxic stress can harm normal brain and immune system development, impairing the body systems that help to manage stress. These changes can have damaging lifelong health consequences. So compared with higher income households, lower income households have more chronic stress and fewer resources to cope with those stressors, which can negatively affect how parents interact with their children. Financial hardship creates stress that can impede the ability of even highly motivated parents to provide the supportive and stimulating home environments needed for optimal health and development in early childhood. Racism can create chronic stress for parents of color of all economic levels. Experiences of racial discrimination have been shown to trigger physiologic mechanisms involved in the body's response to stressors in general. These mechanisms can be triggered not only by overt or dramatic incidents, but also by chronic experiences that may be unintentional, that may be ambiguous. Chronic stress due to any cause, including racial discrimination, may make it more difficult for parents to provide optimal uh, stimulation and support. And now the third pathway that I wanted to highlight is through um, uh, development, through cognitive, emotional, and behavioral development. Uh, 
early cognitive and behavioral development provides a foundation for later health outcomes, including cardiovascular disease, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, smoking, drug use, violence, and depression. Early developmental damage related to toxic stress can lead to difficulties paying attention and to poor impulse control, which can hamper educational success and subsequent economic and social well-being as an adult. Parents' economic resources can affect the quality and stability of their relationships with their young children, which affect the cognitive stimulation that the children receive. Middle class, as well as poor children, are often at a developmental disadvantage compared with their economically better off counterparts. Researchers have estimated, and I think a lot of you will probably remember uh, this, researchers have estimated that by age three, the average child in a professional family has heard 30 million more words than the average child in a family on, on public assistance. And hearing more words, we know, enhances brain development, which predicts school performance and economic and social opportunities in adulthood, which then predict adult health. Maternal depression, which can inhibit mother-infant bonding and reduce a mother's ability to cognitively stimulate her child, is more prevalent among low-income mothers. Here, I just want to uh, uh, underscore the importance of the role of both structural racism, which tends to um, track people of color into lower socioeconomic uh, levels, and um, other forms of racism, which are direct um, psychological stressors and which operate regardless of the socioeconomic level of, of a person. So the moderately good news is that we do know something about how to intervene. There have been some very exciting results from studies of center-based care and home visiting. For example, healthier adults, less crime, less incarceration, less drug addiction, higher employment and earnings, less public assistance. Head Start has had some inconsistent results, but there is a fair amount, there are a fair amount of um, data on Head Start showing good short-term and actually good long-term results without necessarily showing such good intermediate-term results, which has been, has been um, puzzling. So although, so I think some people started to advocate for home visiting and um, early, childhood, uh, early childhood care centers as the, the panacea. Um, but although we know that a number of highly intensive interventions have proved, have produced impressive results, these studies were very small. We don't know about their replicability, and we're a long way from, uh, from knowing how to go to scale, um, and certainly from knowing about which components of these highly intensive interventions are the ones that are, that are essential. So, you know, there was that part in the, the definition of health equity um, that I mentioned that really underscored the, the fact that if you're talking about health equity, you are talking about going upstream toward more fundamental and root, root causes. Um, uh, the, some of these um, proposals for, uh, for contributions to dealing with um, the disparities that start, in the social disparities in early childhood that wind up showing up as health disparities later in life. Some of these um, have not been evaluated in those terms. Some have. The ones that have not been evaluated in health terms, um, I think that uh, we always need to think about um, connecting the dots, where we have a body of literature, and it doesn't go all the way from here to here, but it goes from here to here, and then we go from here to here. And we, and we do that all the time. And of course, we would prefer to directly connect the two poles, but we're not going to be able to do that with um, with the uh, under most of the underlying determinants of health, and that is um, partly because uh, what's involved is, are very long and complex causal chains, and the health effects of the 
the root causes often don't manifest until decades later. And how often do we have longi longitudinal studies or that are longi you know that go on for long enough to really capture the effects of health um, of lifelong health you know based on experiences in in early childhood. Um, so that that's a that's a very big challenge. I think we need larger studies and we need more longitudinal studies. Uh, we should take advantage of natural experiments as well, um, with a commitment to more rigorous evaluation than often happens with them. And we need to go to scale with programs that have looked good on a small scale. The challenges that we face, um, I think, in um, effectively addressing the effects of poverty and racism on, on, on early childhood and as those manifest li lifelong um, are not just com uh, confined to the realm of research, but, uh, but there are a number of them in other domains. So for example, the way things work right now, if the transportation sector makes an investment that is going to ultimately improve health of uh, some uh, communities that have been cut off from opportunities before, the transportation sector is not going to get the credit for that. It's going to be the, the, health, the health sector. Um, and so this question of the incentive, where are the incentives, um, uh, has, to be, um, has to be dealt with, uh, as well as the, um, as the issue of, of long enough, long enough follow-up. Uh, some major business groups have gotten behind early childhood, uh, early childhood care centers in a very big way, Business Roundtable, PNC Financial Services, and their argument when they were arguing, they have argued for universal early care and education programs based on uh, its role in creating a, a more healthy and productive workforce um, in the future. And I think we need to talk about arguments like that um, when we're talking about the need for investments in early, um, in early childhood. We also, among the challenges that we face, um, is the fact that you know, it's easier to argue for services for, for little kids, but not so much for the parents. But guess what? <laughs> kids live with parents, parents or house, their, their household, they live with adults, adults, and it is so clear that if you're going to address the needs of a child, you have to address the needs of the whole household. And so I think in order to do that and to be able to influence policy um, uh, in that way, we're going to have to find a way to change the narrative because the current narrative is that the adults are the undeserving, the irresponsible, the, the shiftless. Um, I think that um, we have to create political will um, to make it happen, and that talking about the effects on the middle class are actually a very important part of that, and that there is, you know, there is plenty of data to support that. One of the reasons that I think that the, the concept of health equity catching on is so important is that I think that can be a way of changing the narrative, setting norms um, for what uh, you know what? What is ex what is acceptable, including in the in the world in the world of science, and uh, making the norm one that um, that uh, is concerned with justice, um, uh, among among other concerns. Obviously, the sci scientific concerns. Um, lastly, I think that racism, and mainly structural. Um, racism is one of the big barriers to funding for any social initiatives. So addressing racism is one of the biggest but most essential um, challenges. This is just a screenshot of the um, report that came out of RWJ a little while ago. And then finally, I, I'd like to end with a quote from uh, Stanford Law Professor Ralph Richard Banks, who said, we will find a way to undo intergenerational racial disparities, and I would add, inter and intergenerational poverty, when we find the will. And to find the will, we need to recognize what's at stake. Thank you.
So Thank shall you so I much, stay Dr. here Braven. for y questions? Yes. Or? I think you can either stay there or, or you can go up to the uh, table in the front as well. Uh, so thank you very much. We really appreciate your presentation this morning. And uh, just a reminder to committee members, uh, please, if you have a, a comment or question, raise your tent card like this, and then I'll recognize you so that you can uh, ask your question. Um, we have about 10 minutes uh, for questions and answers. And uh, so we'll go first with the committee, and then if we have any time left over, we'll open it up to the public. Yes, Dr. Perrin. Thank you, Paula, for a marvelous presentation. So can you, can you talk a bit about political will and sort of what do you think is needed? What are the arguments to sort of bring the change that you're talking about? I, I think we need to talk at multiple levels. And one level is the, is the very pragmatic. Um, and that's about the, the, the return on investment um, and uh, talking in terms of the, uh, the uh, healthier, more productive workforce. We t can talk about uh, how um, a majority of people applying to go into the armed services are rejected because of uh, obesity or um, other health problems and that having a healthier uh, pool uh, for military recruitment is good for national security. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and, and we can talk about the, the, the savings in terms of uh, less crime, less incarceration. Um, so the, the the pragmatic realm, but then I think we also should talk about what's right. And, and that's where the equity frame comes in because equity is about, is about justice. Um, and uh, the, I think if there's any hope at all for humans <laughs> to behave in a way that um, uh, is more supportive of each other, uh, it, it, it can be, if it can be elicited, it uh, can, uh, it's most likely to be elicited around babies, little babies and, and, and toddlers. So we, we, have that, we have that going for us. But once we recognize that children live in families, and even if they're in the best of um, early care and education programs during the day, they still spend most of their time at home, um, and uh, so we're going to need to be able to um, to change that that narrative about these these undeserving adults that they that they live with. So I think it's the the two prong, both pragmatic and and the moral or or, or ethical. Um. Thank you, Dr. Levitt, and then Dr. Iruka. So, thanks very much. Um, let's see if I can ask this question the right way without offending anybody. So, the, the, you started the conversation with um, broad definitions of obstacles, and I'm, I'm wondering, and I, I sort of I felt sort of a vagueness of, about it. I mean, you know, poverty, discrimination, and power, powerlessness, I sort of understand the definitions, but they're very broad and nonspecific. And, and that's generally where the conversation starts. So I'm wondering in your experiences whether starting the conversations about obstacles that are very specific, um, that people can uh, attend to, as opposed mm -hmm. to generalized terms which people tend to not attend to, whether you, you've experienced or seen um, better uptake of the kinds of things that you're that you're talking about in terms of obstacles. Do you, you understand what I'm? Yeah, yeah, at? and and I think it's a great point. And I think that I mean not just in this instance, but in in general, um, if we just talk about the 
abstractions without being concrete enough. A lot of people don't don't get it. Um, I had a very limited amount of time <laughs> here and had to talk in mostly in generalities, although I tried to, to throw in a few a few concrete examples. But I, I, I think that that's true. If we talk about, you know, how is it that we can create political will, um, that, that I think the more concrete the, the image, the, um, the more likely it is to move someone. I think we need to, at times, we need to move from the specific to the general so that people get it. <laughs> that, that it isn't just that one thing, you know? It's that one thing and all of these others and then how that, you know, the toxicity of their interaction with each other in terms of understanding what poverty does and what racism does. But, uh, but I think it's a great point. And yet when we can lead with the concrete, lead with the reporters, you know, this, they start with a story, right, about an individual and that grabs us more than the abstractions, or probably those, most of you are scientists, so like me, maybe you love the abstractions even more, but most, for most people, it's going to be the, the, the specifics that get through. So. Hello, thank you so much for your really great overview. My question really um, is about how would you measure racism or structural racism? And then um, what will be some of your suggestions to actually address it? Because most of your examples really focus a lot on sort of the poverty end of, of things, like whether it's earned income tax credits or housing. But how would you address sort of the issue of structured racism? OK. That's a really tough question or a tough um, pair of, of questions, but it's 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 a really important one. Um, uh, when I think about the way racism works, I, I think of it, you know, uh, and I'm thinking about uh, uh, generalities. There's it works partly by tracking people into low SES. So all of the arguments about SES and and the um, how that harms health apply to those people of color who are of low SES, but of course not all people of color are. But there's this other category of racism which can affect people of any socioeconomic level. In fact, there's, there are data and some reason to believe that the, the sort of the direct psychological insult um, of interpersonal uh, racism um, may uh, affect people of high education and higher income more strongly um, even than it affects lower. And that sounds counterintuitive, and I'd love to talk more about it, but there, re there really is accumulating data on that, including um, on, on preterm birth. Um, my group recently um, published something. So measuring racism, I think you measure the uh, you measure because one, you know, branch of it is the socioeconomic effect. You measure socioeconomic differences by race, um, uh, but then that's not going to capture right what's happening with the other. So, so that you have to ask questions about experiences of racism, and um, you know there are a lot of scales that are out there. Um, uh, that I think are very good. I haven't, in my work, I've been unable to, I haven't had the space on the, the survey that I um, work on with the state of California um, uh, to be able to use those, you know, full and, and fully, um, fully tested uh, uh, scales. And so my colleagues and I have developed um, some simpler measures that came out of some qualitative work that we did several years ago that CDC supported. And in the qualitative work, we drew women out. There were groups of uh, women, African-American women with African-American facilitators and note, note, note takers um, about what their uh, experiences of racism were. And people talked about, the women talked about incidents, especially incidents in childhood 
but most of what they talked about was not incidents. They, was, they talked about carrying around with them this feeling of vigilance, of having to be ready in case it happened, of worrying that it would happen, worrying, was that, right? was that an insult? Was that not an insult? Um, uh, that vigilance. So, uh, so we developed a, a couple of questions for that. So there, there's a rich literature on this, um, and, and I do believe, yeah, we, you can't just capture by looking at socioeconomic um, distribution. That's, part of, that's a big part of it. But, but you, you have to capture those other experiences as well. So if you want to know, the um, uh, question we've asked is, overall in your life up, up to now, how often have you worried that you might be treated or judged unfairly based on your race or ethnic group? And then the answers were very often, somewhat often, not very often, not at all. And recently we added a question about... Um, about, <coughs> excuse me, women's worries that loved ones would be treated unfairly because that had also come out in that qualitative work, especially the women who had, uh, had sons. Um, Thank you. I know we're about out of time. Do we have time for one more question? Thank you. Dr. Watt? Mr. is fine with me. Uh, <laughs> um, the question, my question is about I, what I heard, one of the things I heard in the presentation is about the basically interdisciplinary kind of approach that is required to address a lot of the, the determinants that you talked about. And I heard you say something about an example that, you know, like there are certain sectors or industries where they just don't see themselves in this because, you know, like transportation. But they, are, they do matter, and housing would be another one, and I'm sure there are others. Can you talk about, and you, you talked about how the challenge is kind of finding the right incentives for them to see that they are part of the solution and to get involved and, and engage. Do you have any ideas about how we would do that in terms of con to, to help connect the science to the, to the policy and practice for the, particularly for the, for the sectors that are, they don't see themselves as sort of serving kids and families in a more direct way? I do, um, but uh, unfortunately, I can't kid myself that I think it's easy to do this. But this is the idea I have about it has really come from um, experiences that people have had with the sort of health and all policies um, kind of work in other countries. Um, and um, people who've had a lot of experience have talked about the need to, um, that, that you can't do it by just going to this sector, going to that sector, that sector, it has to come from the highest level of government because it's only at the highest level of government that they can change the incentives and that that's where it has really, that's where it has really worked. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'd be hard pressed to say, well, just, you know, then how would the budgeting look? I can't, can't answer that, but I think people have, at least on, on the scale of some cities um, uh, and even some states or provinces, um, grappled with that, you know, but always by involving the, the, the highest level of, of government. So. Thank you so much. We'll go ahead and move on to the next agenda item. Great. Um, Thank you so much, Dr. Braveman and Dr. Parker.